Um, if you would, we're going to be uh, talking out of Genesis chapter 2. And the, the title, I would, have, I would have to say the title of my sermon would be Second Guessing God. Um, second Guessing God or a question mark of do we doubt? So if everyone is ready, the scripture is up, uh, chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded to the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat, you will surely die. Then we're going to skip to chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and then 14 to 15. I'm going to go ahead and read it all. And then we're going to come back, and I'm going to highlight some key points that, that I've got out. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will surely not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good food, or good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took and ate some. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I have commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat the dust all the days of your life. I will put animated enmity uh, between you and your woman and between your offspring and hers he will crush your head and he will strike at your heels lord i want to thank you for the opportunity to be in church today um lord i ask that anything that is said it 100 percent be you not me and i want the congregation to take out of this um what you you would have them take out of it and i pray that everything again that is said that it, it be said for your glory and only for your glory at all so i was thinking this week on what i was going to speak on and and adam and eve came to mind and the, the tree of knowledge and the serpent it all came to mind and the reason the reason being is it, it may be a little different of a, of a spin on it but for doubt and I say that I believe that God trusts us to make good decisions in our lives. We have free will. We have free reign to make basically every decision that we want. And God lets us make 
those decisions, whether they be right or they be wrong. My first point is a simple fact that God put us in control. We're basically in control of our destinies, so to speak. God knows what is going to happen. He's already lived it. He's already, he already knows. But we have the ultimate outcome of everything that happens. We're able to wake up in the morning and basically do what we feel like. I mean, obviously, we have responsibilities. You have the choice to, to live those responsibilities, to go to bed when you're supposed to. Jace asked me the other night, he's like, Daddy, when do you go to bed? And I'm like, you know what, I'm tired. And he's like, well, who tells you to go to bed? My body. You know, I told him, I said, it's a little different. I said, no one actually tells Daddy it's bedtime. Whereas I tell him, you know, you need to go to bed. I was like, but if I stay up all night and I'm exhausted and then have to get up and go to work the next morning, that's on me. You know, nobody's there holding my hand. We have the ability to serve God, not to serve God, to serve ourselves. I mean, to serve other people, to do whatever you want. Again, the Lord gave us power. He gave us the free will. He's not going, uh, you know, he's not down here uh, just looking at every single thing, every single option and choice that we have. All right, well, you need to do that one. 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 There are times in our lives as Christians. There's times in our lives as parents, as husband and wives. There are things, obviously, the Lord needs to be involved in everything that you do. I mean, small stuff, you need to pray about it. You need to ask him for his wisdom and guidance and listen. And he will persuade you if, you list, if you're listening to make the right decisions. But he's not going to just in bold neon you know, letters say, you need to do this. You should wear these shoes today. You should wear this tie. There's certain times where you actually have to listen to God. And you have to understand that, you know, Again, we control a lot of stuff that happens. My second point is going to speak on the serpent. We're going to go back to uh, 15 and 16, where God was commanding uh, the man. He, he put him in the Garden of Eden to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man... You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, for when you eat of this tree, you will surely die. So, I mean, that's pretty clear cut in my, in my book. You know, it makes it pretty clear cut. The, the Lord straight, he straight tells Adam, if you do this, you're going to die. This is something that, you know, you should not do. I, I don't want you to do it. My second point is the serpent or the devil is a liar. He is 100% a liar. You see here, he goes to Eve knowing. He, he asked her, you know, slyly, you know, I mean, did the Lord really, did he really mean, you know, you can't eat from a tree? Like, really? Come on. He knew what the Lord had told her. He knew what the outcome was was going to be he is a liar he is you know just he's sly he's slick and i got it written down here the devil has come he is coming at us and will come at us to bring us down and to stop any good from coming out of our lives if you think that he is out for anything else in this world you are dead wrong the devil, 100%, is only trying to stop the advancement of the kingdom of God. The Lord has rules in place. He has things that he's commanded us to do. He has asked us not to do. And it's all laid out for you in the Bible. But the devil is going to do everything he can, as he did with Eve, to convince you otherwise. Because that's basically his job. That's what he does. He knows he's already lost. So he's trying to take as many of us as he can with him. Our job 
is to understand that God gave us the power. He gave us the control of the situations that we're in, of what the devil may bring to us. We, as a church, we as individuals, have to understand that and really get a hold of it. And once you do, i got a little secret for you that you may not understand or you may not know. The devil already knows that. He already knows that we basically, we have the reins to what happens. God is the power behind it. God is the force behind it, but we're kind of, you know, the middleman. We're kind of like the, the puppet. You know, God is the one holding the strings. He's the one holding what, hap what, what can happen, but he lets us make the decisions ultimately. The devil knows that. He knows where he's at. I, I can assure you, he knows where he's at. That's why he comes at you like a serpent. You know, late at night or, you know, slithering his way, sweet talking, smooth walking, you know, and trying to just uh, sly his way into making you backslide, making you do whatever it is that God has commanded us not to do. And in this case was uh, getting Adam and Eve to eat from the forbidden uh, tree. The devil will make, make you believe that he actually cares about you. He'll make you believe that he's actually here to, to help you. And that, um, you know, like he told Eve, um, let's see here. He told Eve, he said, surely you will not die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat, it will open your eyes and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See what he does? He, he plays with words. He likes playing with words. He's like, you're not, you're not going to die. Like, Lord's being a little dramatic. He's, he's not going to kill you for eating an apple from, from the wrong tree. All that's going to happen is you're going to be, be more like God. And he just doesn't want you to be like God or be like him because there can only be one alpha. Well, there, that he's right about one part. There is only one Alpha, and, and that's the Lord God Almighty. But he's going to kind of downplay, uh, I guess you could say, the consequences of what happens. Make them think that they're, they're not all that bad. You know, the Lord doesn't really want you to do this. But if you do, you'll be all right in the end. It's fine. It's not really going to be as bad as he's making you think. And he has to use different tactics like that uh, again because he knows where he's at. And then he also knows well, us as humans naturally, unfortunately, I think we have a tendency to doubt uh, maybe in things that we don't understand, we don't see, um, we doubt ourselves. Um, I have a big problem with that. I have a, a, a big issue with that for a long time. I doubted myself as a Christian. I doubted, doubted myself whether as um, I was worthy enough to, you know, be able to stand behind the pulpit and, and, and try to, to talk with people and save people because I'm like, I've done exactly the same things that they're doing now. And I still mess up. My next point is own up to your mistakes. And I say that, I say that because if you read right here on verse 12 in chapter 3, the man said, The woman you put here with me gave me this fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, What have you done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate from the fruit, or from the tree. So right there, immediately, the Lord asked Adam, you know, what, what did you do? Hold up. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was my wife. It was on her. And as soon as the Lord asked her, hold up. Hold up. If he's blaming me, I'm blaming him. You know, the kid, my kids do that all the time all the time. If Jace did something, it was either Jackie, it was either Ebony, or 
uh, yeah, it was the ghost or it was trolls. He's got on his troll kick now. It, it was the trolls, Dad. It was the troll. Whatever, dude. <laughs> but you know, own up to your mistakes. You know, own up to um, if you if you're doubting, if you doubt God about something, you know, any any thing in general, and maybe he he kind of questions you about why you're you're doubting him, or um, instead of basically playing the blame game, look at the issues that are going on. Look at what has happened. Like in this instance, you know, Adam could have been, he could have said, yeah, Eve gave me the fruit. I ate. I should have stopped myself because you specifically told me, do not do this. Yes, you may have been influenced. Yes, you may have been, you know, coerced to do something. But again, we have control in our actions. We have the ability to uh, stop ourselves uh, from doing things, from saying things, from going places that we know we shouldn't go, you know, from watching things on television we know we shouldn't watch. And if you do make the mistake, don't fall back on blaming other people. You know, don't fall back on blaming others. The best thing we can do as a church, the best thing we can do as individual Christians is to look at ourselves, look at the, the situation that we're in, find out what we, we did that we could have corrected, correct it and become better people, become better Christians. Amen. If we do that, and I've said it before, if we do that as a church and individually work on each other, we will become stronger as a church body. We will become stronger as you know, just a church here in Cedar Rapids to where we can continue to grow. We can continue to just you know, be on fire from God and keep bringing people in. And they will see that whereas we are working spiritually, we are still in the natural also and we're going to make mistakes. But we're the type of people who are going to own up to those mistakes and we're going to correct them. Um, you know, just speaking on that, it's... It's not necessarily something that, uh, that I did, but uh, Christian sent me a text. I think it was last week or the week before. He was like, hey, man. He said, what's going on? Would you liking this stuff on Facebook? I'm like, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I was looking at the, the caption that, that he sent me, and it was something like really that I didn't need to be you know, liking or looking at. My name was down there said William like this and blah 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 and I'm like uh dude I don't know I, I, I don't know what this is so I was trying to get it straightened out like an hour after we got off the phone something else popped up there and I told Jess I'm like I don't know what's going on I, I've never even been to this page before in my life I don't I don't understand um you know but instead of getting you know mad at Christian I'd be like you know, why are you sweating me for? You know, I wouldn't be doing stuff like this on Facebook, blah, blah, blah. So people, you know, I looked, I looked at it and like, you know, this is something I need to get fixed. I need to get straightened out, you know. And, you know, we did. I think eventually what it was is somebody hacked into my, my profile and was putting some nasty, raunchy stuff up there. But um, we got that taken care of. You know, and, I, and I say that for the simple fact that, uh, oh, well, you know, somebody took my phone and there was on my Facebook page, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I could have played the blame on somebody else, wrote it off as, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but instead of doing that, you know, I took Christian's advice. I got my phone. I got to the root of the problem. I took care of it. I changed it so that hopefully it doesn't happen again. My, my main point that I want to make sure you guys get, and I mean, I really want to emphasize on. For one, God is wiser than we are. He's obviously been around a lot longer than we have. If he commands you to do something, 
or he asks you to do something and presses it on your heart, I can assure you that he's doing it for the, the benefit of you. Not only will it benefit him, but it's going to benefit you. As I was preparing for this message, I was looking back on previous messages because I usually date each message just so I can, you know, just kind of kind of get a, 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 I guess, a count of how I've preached, what I've preached, when I preached it. And it's been over a year now um, that Christian has allowed me to, to come up here and speak to the congregation. And... Uh, If I had kept doubting God, if I had had kept doubting myself, you know, any message that that I have been able to prepare through God's help wouldn't have have been preached. You know, maybe something that the Lord has allowed me to say has has touched somebody um, in the congregation that wouldn't have happened. God tells you things. He sets things up, not only for his good, but for your good also. This has brought me closer to him. It has helped me bring my family closer to him. My last point, and again, it's the one I want to emphasize on. I'm going to read this. It's the bottom of... uh, Verse 14, chapter 3. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. You will eat dust for all the days of your life. I will put an enemy into me between you and your woman and between your offspring and and hers he will crush your head and you will strike at his heels the part that i really want to to kind of hit on is really verse 14 and the reason being is cuz when god addresses the serpent he's talking he's talking to the devil he he's he's talking to the devil and he tells him right there in this verse basically you are the most cursed thing on the face of the earth. I mean, it says right there, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't say over all the humans and everything like that, but for one, I mean, are, are we not greater than the animals in God's eyes? I mean, if you read the Bible, if you, if you know, a little bit about the Bible, I really believe that in God's eyes we're worth more than a, than a cow to him. Amen. So if we are, and he's telling the devil right there that you're, you're less than livestock to me, then that automatically lets you know that our worth to, towards God versus the devil's worth towards God is vastly different. And and the biggest thing, and my my actual point is, the devil or serpent is beneath us. That's that's, that's really, uh, I think, the meat of of the message today that I want to to really get across to you guys. The devil is beneath us. Yet, as individuals, we walk around as like wounded warriors. Because we think for some reason the devil has some type of of reign over us. I don't see where it says that in the Bible. I've never been told that in the Bible. I've never been told that, you know, by God. I've never, I mean, I've personally, I felt like the devil had me in chains and locked up. But, you know, Amanda sung about it this morning. I mean, we're free. You know, we're free to run, we're free to dance, we're free to shout. I mean, there's no, there's nothing that the devil can do that he can bring on us that we don't control the outcome to. 
You know, not only is he under us, but he's under all the wild animals in the kingdom of God. You know, he's literally basically, you know, a little a little snake that you just you walk over. You look at and you're like, you know, just kick it with your shoe. I mean, you know, there's a um, there's a song that we used to sing um, at the Christian camp I went to. Um, the devil was under my feet. The Holy Ghost is holding him down, Lord. You know, that's where he's at. He knows that's where he's at. He understands it. I mean, he was told straight up out of God's mouth, you are nothing to me. You are nothing to my creation. You have no dominion. You know, I've said it before, you know, that the, the world is the devil's playground. Why? Aren't we here? Are we here as Christians? Are we here as a church? So why does the world have to be the devil's playground? Why can't it be our playground? It's because we've given him too much power. That's where everything he has, that's where all the, the things that he's able to do, it's because we give it to him. We relinquish what the Lord died and gave us on the cross back to the devil. And we've done it freely. We as a people, as a church, have rule over Satan. We have rule over that serpent. Yes, he may be sly talking, you know, and, and make things seem better than, than what they, they maybe are or maybe not. But in the end, he does what he has to do because he knows that if we, if we really, if we were to hit our knees, if we were getting, get into the word like the Lord wants us to, there wouldn't be anything that he could do to sway us from the love of God, from the direction of God. And, you know, it excites me. It, it really does. And, you know, I'm kind of just toning myself back a little bit. Um, I'm, I come from a Pentecostal church, and I can, I can shout and I can scream, so I'm kind of just slow down a little bit because I... You can shout Because I, I mean, because I mean, talk, you know, talking, I mean, talking, talking about... Talking about where the devil's at, it makes me excited because I know where, where I've been. I know where, where God has brung me from, and I know the things that the devil has thrown at me, the, the, the life uh, experiences, the hardships. And for the years and years, I was just felt like I was being ground in the dirt, ground in the dirt, ground in the dirt. To so look back at that, read this scripture, and see that all of that was basically by my doing, because I just stood up and I was like, you know what, I, I can't do this. Well, you're right. As a people, we can't do it. But when you have God on your side, when you have God standing beside you or you know, walking hand in hand, however you want to look at it, it, it doesn't change the fact that no matter what you're going through, the devil is beneath us. He is underneath us. We walk the earth on top of his head. We need to start acting like it as a church. Stop doubting what the Lord has already given you. Stop doubting the freedoms. Stop doubting the, the, the um, freedom from health issues, the freedom from financial issues, the freedom from marriage, the freedom of the workplace. Walk around. I don't care how tall you are. Everyone should walk around where they're about seven foot tall with your chest up high, your head held high, simply because... Nothing that the devil can bring to you, nothing that the devil can, can, can give us, we should be like, oh, you know, this is a game changer. What's a game changer? The Lord God Almighty died on the cross. He defeated you. That's the only game changer. Period. That changed everything. He lives in me. I serve the Almighty God. What are you? You're beneath me. You're but a speck of dust that I can pour some water on and poof, you're gone. Right. So I encourage you, please, as a church, as individuals, understand this last point is so, it's, to me, it's probably the most important one. Because if we can get this, if we can understand this, then everything else will fall in line. 
If we can understand where the devil is, where our place is to him, we will walk like we're somebody. You won't walk with your heads down. You won't walk ashamed. No matter if you have a job, if you don't have a house, if you don't have a car, no matter the things that you're going through, the things that you're struggling with right now, if you understand where the devil is and where you are, you're here. You're top of the food chain. He's the zebra that's getting chopped in half by the, you know, the alligator that comes up from underneath him. I mean, he's nothing. Walk like it. Talk like it. I encourage you to be cocky. Let him know you are nothing. Tell him every day, wake up in the morning, the first thing you do, devil, you're nothing. Let him know right off gate when you get up in the morning, just give him a big slap in the face and see what he does. I mean, I'm serious. Because if you really, if you really embrace the fact and who we serve or what he says, cursed are you above all the livestock and animals, and that includes us. He's cursed more, you know, I mean, I can't, I can't explain how bad I want you guys to, to know this and understand this. Because if, if we got it really in our minds, in our hearts, do you understand how different of a church we would have? Do you understand how different of a church service we would have? I mean, things would change and not only would they change but they would change very quickly i mean very quickly you know it gets it gets talked about you know the days of old when people were um you know being raised from the dead and so forth and so on i think we, we've talked about it in men's group um before i think what has happened to church and what has happened to individuals in the church we've let the world dilute God. We've let the world add the extra doubt that, you know, how can you serve someone who can do these things that you've never seen, that you've never really experienced? And when you start getting around people, and we've all, we've all had someone, a relative or a friend, who's always just chirping in your ear, Saying, oh, man, we, you can't do that, blah, blah, that's a stupid idea. I mean, you know, blah, blah, blah. Those people who are always looking to hold you back because they want to stay in a little cesspool that they're in and they don't want you to leave them. So they try to hold you there. You know, and we let people like that and we let the world influence us and let us doubt what the Lord has already told us and, and what he's already commanded. And when we do that, I think it dilutes the power of God. I think it dilutes what he, he really wants to have happen. It just waters it down a little bit. And then when that happens, the devil can slip in and he can start wreaking havoc in, in different ways. But again, we are above the devil. We walk on two feet with our heads held high he was cursed to crawl on his belly and eat the dust from underneath our shoes. You know, doubt is a feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction. Again, as humans, we do doubt. You know, we doubt things we don't understand. We doubt things that we can't see. Um, but the thing that we don't have to doubt at all is this book. Amen. This book is 100% truth. What is said in here has and will come to pass. If you have any doubts, if the devil is putting anything in your head, get your Bible out, read your Bible, and just encourage yourself. Philippians 4 and 13. You know, us alone as, as individuals, we can't do anything. I've said it before, and, and I'll say it until the day I die. Without God, you know, I'd be nothing. Anything 
that I, I do, I owe to the Lord. Philippians 4 and 13, right here. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The devil will tell you that that's a lie. He will have you doubt that verse. And I'm here to tell you right now that the devil is a lie. There's nothing that we cannot do through God who gives us the strength and the power to do it. And we as a church, as individuals, need to embrace that. We need to get a hold of it and hold on to it like it's something precious. You know, if you have kids, hold on to it like it's, like it's your kid. Like it's something that you can't lose. Because if we were to fully embrace the fact that we are basically the top of the food chain and we have the Almighty God walking hand in hand with us, then the devil doesn't stand a chance. So I'm just going to leave you with a question. And the question is, do you doubt what the Lord is wanting to do? And if you do, what are you going to do to change it? You guys know that the Bible says that one day we'll look down upon Satan and we'll be like, that's the dude who made the nations tremble? That, that, you sure, God? Certain, come, that's the devil? Can't be. Man, that's one of the devil's biggest lies, that he is bigger and mightier. And, and, and look at the world and the way the world paints Satan. He's this big, red, muscular beast with horns. Man, he's not that. He's a pathetic little snake crawling on the ground. You don't have any reason to be afraid of him. I love, I love uh, this, this message. What I realized during this message, uh, and you all know me, my life's an open book. I realized that, that Satan has worked this way in my life, the same way he worked in Adam and Eve's life. Um, the, what, what Satan did to Adam and Eve, because he had no authority over them, he had no power over them, he couldn't force them to eat the apple. Uh, just like what it was saying, he made them doubt. Did God really say, are you sure God said don't eat that apple? And then what he said was, well, okay, sure, God said don't eat that apple. But when he said that you would die, he was lying. That's not really true. So most of y'all know that I used to be addicted to pornography pretty darn heavily. Um, and I remember as a Christian who was addicted to porn, Satan did the same tactic, the exact same tactic to me. First thing he said was, I remember hearing a sermon about your sin will find you out. And the first thing he said was, dude, your, your sin won't find you out. God's lying. When the Bible says your sin will find you out, that's talking about other sin. You're good at it. So you don't, you're good, man. You don't have to worry. Uh, and then he really, he did the exact same thing. God really said, don't even like that, that truth. What he said to me was, he said, look at everyone else in the Bible who has sexual sin. I mean, you've got David, but David did it, right? Solomon had all these concubines, and so aren't you, aren't you, uh, aren't you, don't you want to be at least as holy as them? And I mean, they're doing it, so it's good. And, and I begin to, like, overanalyze and just start to doubt, really, that what God said. Well, God said, if you lust after everyone in your heart, you commit adultery. Well, is it really the same? And, I mean, these other holy guys did it. And, and truthfully, man, he told me time and time again, your sin will not find you out. Well, my sin found me out. It's the end of the story. It's just, my sin found me out. I got a wife that I can't lie to, no matter if my life depended on it. Dude, she can fight through me. It's insane. <laughs> uh, it makes it very hard to buy her presence. Um, <laughs> and, and, and really, what I love is you said something, Will, about admitting, owning up to what you've done. We just studied the story of, of Joseph in LIW class. And what was really cool is, is Judah sold Joseph into slavery. It was Judah uh, who, who had the idea, let's sell Joseph. Well, well, first he wanted to kill him. And he said, well, let's sell him, and we'll make a little bit of money off of him. Uh, and so Judah had this horrible sin over him. Of course, all his other brothers were in on it. Uh, Reuben kind of tried to save him, but didn't do a really great job.
great job. So they were all kind of guilty. And for around 22 years, they sat with their sin. And then finally they met up with Joseph. And before they even knew it was Joseph, before they even knew Joseph was alive, Judah admits to his sin. And he says, the Lord found out what I've done. The Lord is finally bringing us to guilt. And then Benjamin is found with this cup, and, and he's about to go and be arrested and enslaved. And Judah says, no, it's our guilt. It's mine. Let me take the responsibility. I deserve the one to be enslaved. And when he did that, he was given freedom. When he did that, Joseph broke down into tears and said, it's me, your long-lost brother. And he restored them, and he gave them grace and power and authority and land and all of these things. But it wasn't until Judah decided to completely and utterly repent and be like, look, I did it, man. I did it. The Bible says that, that Jesus is faithful and just to forgive all sins if we would just confess them. If we just own up to them. And that's how we put the devil to shame. That's how we, when we look at him, we be like, you know what? I believe that God is full of grace, and I believe that he's full of love. And so I don't need to be afraid to confess. I don't need to be afraid of my sin anymore. Because that's the other lie Satan will tell you. Satan will tell you if you confess, then, you, then, then everyone's going to know what you really are. And then you're going straight to H-E double hockey stage. Well, God already knows what you did. He already knows what you do. You're not fooling him. But Jesus, when we, when we confess, we're saying, I believe that, that God is as full of love and as full of mercy and as full of grace as he says he is. And I believe that really puts the devil to shame. It takes all of his power away. When we confess exactly how good God is, that we're not afraid to confess exactly how bad we are. Father, I just I ask that we as a church would understand that we're not perfect. And we would accept that none of us are perfect and that we sin. Lord, that we would confess to one another, man, I'm not perfect. I've done this, I do that. I'm struggling with this, I'm addicted to that. And we confess with boldness and the authority of Christ, knowing that you are faithful to forgive and to restore us to righteousness and to clean us. Lord, I, 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 do, I pray that we would stop giving Satan credit, that we would stop glorifying him. Satan told me to do it. Satan made me to do it. Lord, that the only person who ever got glory was you, Father. Lord, that you redeemed us, that you restore us, that you forgave us. As, as Wendy and Joshua said in our video announcements, less of us, more of you. Less of us. Help us to die to ourselves. Lord, I just thank you for this word. I thank you for for Brother Will and the message that he preached today. Father, I ask that we would never be a church that is a slave to sin. That, that we are so emboldened and empowered by your gospel, by your good news, by your forgiveness, that we can always walk in freedom. Not ashamed, not afraid, but repentant and restored. Father, I love you and I thank you for this word. Let it be encouraging to us that we have nothing to fear. In Jesus' name, amen. One last thing. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with temptation, he will always provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure ever are bold enough to come to me and say, Pastor, I sinned, but I couldn't help it. The first thing, people say this all the time. I don't know why. People call me up right after they sin and say, hey, man, I couldn't help it. First thing I'm going to say to you is, you're a liar. And, and every time they say, what? What do you mean I'm a liar? I'm like, well, either you're a liar or the Bible's a liar. And they go, what do you mean either I'm a liar or the Bible's a liar? I couldn't help it, Pastor. I was tempted. And, and the answer, the Bible says, there is no temptation that we can't help. God always provides a way out. Do not give Satan power over your life to say that he can do something to tempt me so strong that I can't help it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Getting all fiery. Thanks. <laughs>